Okay. So thank you very much uh, to NHS Health Scotland and to the SHRC for inviting me here today. Um, it's great to be uh, in a room full of healthcare professionals, uh, and I've probably got less expertise than anyone else in the room on, on those kind of issues, because this is your day-to-day -day practice, and I'm coming in as someone, I hope, who can add value by providing some insights about how human rights can be utilised in your everyday working lives. So my expertise, I hope, I hope at least, is in talking to people who may not necessarily be used to applying human rights frameworks, uh, to think about the policies and practices that they adopt in their organisations. So I talk to everyone from international trade lawyers and diplomats, to people who are running corporations, to public authorities, and to people like yourselves and health authorities, to talk about these kind of human rights frameworks and how they can improve your services and add value in your everyday working lives. Um, but for many people in the room, and I may be wrong here, I'm going to start off with the assumption that human rights is a bit like a foreign language and possibly more like Chinese than French in terms of our understanding of it. So it's quite impenetrable. Uh, we're not quite sure how it works, uh, what the rules are, or how exactly you utilize it in order to make meaningful change. So I just, I'm going to start off by saying three uh, quite basic things, really, and then hopefully we can explore some more, some of the, the detail and the discussion which follows in this session and then throughout the day. So I'm going to start off by explaining what I think human rights are fundamentally about. And in, in that sense, I'll, I will say some of the things that Alan's already spoken about, but possibly say them in a different way that might be, that might be interesting and informative as well. Secondly, then, I'm going to think about the benefits of a human rights approach, including using human rights impact assessment, in areas such as health, where human rights approaches may not always be prevalent. So if we think about uh, policing or the army and torture and all those kind of issues, human rights discourse is used maybe more often, in healthcare less so. So what's the benefit of bringing these human rights approaches in? And then I'm going to consider some of the pitfalls of a human rights approach. What are the problems we might face and say a few words about how we overcome them. Okay, so what are human rights about? So I just want to start by forgetting all the legal technicalities for a moment. Okay, and let's start with a thought about the basic rationale or philosophy behind human rights. And don't worry, I'm not going to go all academic on you and start quoting from philosophers and all that kind of thing. But fundamentally, what I think human rights says is they speak to our common humanity. So the fact that we are all human beings means that we are entitled to a certain minimum level of treatment. We have expectations about why the way we should be treated, which for me acts like a kind of platform upon which we build our everyday lives. And perhaps the most helpful concept here I found in the past is something that Alan touched on, is that of human dignity. <coughs> uh, and when I say human dignity, I don't mean that in a, in a tri trivial way. Uh, human, uh, human dignity, I mean, if you, if you heckle me now when I'm speaking, that's not an infringement of my human rights and human dignity. But it's a more profound idea that I need to have certain freedoms and certain insurances, certain protections from harm in order to live a dignified life and existence, that I won't be tortured or subject to inhuman or degrading treatment, that I have the right to freely express my ideas in a room like today, to hold religious beliefs, a right to privacy and family life, that those are all things that allow me to build and flourish in my own personal life and existence. So that's, for me, what human rights are about. But it's not really very helpful to just talk about human dignity because we could spend, an, and, and philosophers do do this, some academics do this, spend entire days just talking about what that concept means. It's abstract, isn't it? Um, so what human rights law does is sets out or codifies a series of rights that are deemed necessary to protect that dignity. So human rights law prohibits torture or inhuman and degrading treatment, protects a right to a fair trial, protects our right to privacy, our freedom of expression, etc., etc. Some of these rights are absolute, so you can never torture someone or make, suffer inhuman or degrading treatment. And some rights need to be balanced against other values. So, for instance, we might think about the right to privacy and the way it's balanced against, for instance, preventing crime or disorder. So, 
police pe policemen have rights to take your fingerprints, even though that might be, in a sense, an invasion of your privacy. And there are complex balances there. I think later on in the day, we've got some great case studies where we're going to be going through some of those complex ideas and balances and thinking out how they play out in practice. And in a way, that's the kind of your window into the kind of legal expertise that's required to, to deal with human rights law. But I think it's still fundamentally helpful to think back to the idea of a common need for human dignity. So if we have a strong intuition that an action or policy is having a profound effect on individual lives, there may well be a human rights issue here. And I think Alan's example, his mother care, brought that out very well. If we thought about the profound effect on that woman of the treatment she was given, think about that kind of intuition about raising the bar or allowing it to fall on the floor and the human dignity values involved in that. Even without a detailed knowledge of, of, of the minutiae of human rights law, one can come to a, some kind of an understanding about where the human rights issues lie. And we don't want to lose sight of that when we get into the technicalities. Alan's already spoken about briefly comparing human rights with equality law. I just want to say a few, a few words briefly to build on that. So people may be from more familiar with equality uh, law and principles. Often in rooms full of people like yourselves, I find that is the case. Um, what's the added value of a human rights approach? Well, we have equality laws, as Alan said, because some groups are treated less well in society than others. They've been the subject of past discrimination and present discrimination, and so we want to examine our policies and practices very carefully to see how they affect disadvantaged groups. We're fundamentally about comparing the treatment of different groups within society and redressing imbalances. But if we only look at issues through an equality lens, we actually might miss some of the most important issues. So only if there is discrimination between groups do we take action. So for example, my example was that of malnourishment in hospital. This is a problem whoever's suffering from it, isn't it? Um, it doesn't require different particular groups to be discriminated against. If we only look at the way in which particular groups uh, feeding in hospital through the, through the prism of equality, we might see issues like, I don't know, uh, the cultural uh, appropriateness of food, yeah, and what's culturally appropriate. We might miss the fact that people are actually being mal malnourished and underfed because we're, from a human rights perspective, interested in those fundamental platforms that allow us to build our lives, those minimum standards. The best thing to do is look at all these issues in the round, and I'll come on to talking about that in a moment when I talk about equality and human rights impact assessment. So, what are the benefits of a human rights approach in areas like healthcare, where... As I say, human rights approaches may not always be prevalent. So I spend a great deal of my time talking to organizations and groups for whom human rights is like a foreign language. As I said, everything, everything from trade officials to company uh, executives to local authorities to health authorities. Um, and I think there are two fundamental and most important ways in which this sort of human rights approach can make a real difference in these kind of areas. So first of all, Human rights helps us to identify minimum standards that should not be breached. So if we think about areas where we might traditionally think about human rights applying, think about prison guards and torturing a prisoner, that kind of seems like an obvious breach of human rights, doesn't it? Uh, we can make those kind of intuitive thoughts that there's a human rights issue going on here. Denying someone a right to speak at their trial, for instance, another, another issue where we might think, Intuitively, there's a kind of human rights issue at the bottom of this. But in healthcare, it might not always be so obvious. So there's a pro process of identifying the priority issues that we need to tackle in a healthcare setting. So policies on how patients are fed, how wards are configured in order to ensure um, uh, patients' uh, right to private life, for instance, uh, and their privacy. Um, and there's a benefit in working out what these minimum standards are because they're not intuitively obvious. There's a benefit in sitting around in this room and thinking together about how we apply human rights in healthcare settings. Secondly, human rights analysis of policy making, or what we might call human rights and impact assessment in the context of what's already been said, throws up, I think, issues and concerns that authorities might not even have considered if human rights analysis had not been undertaken. So I've been involved in undertaking human rights impact assessments in a number of different settings. I'm just going to share in my experience of one type of impact assessment that I've done today, which is in looking at the impact of public spending cuts on women in Coventry. I'm from Warwick University, so Coventry is my local city. 
So that was a natural place for us to explore uh, <coughs> what the impact of the spending cuts might be on, on women there. Um, and in that context, I'm sure many people in this room are going through these difficult decisions that public authorities are having to make about, about at the moment about where to cut spending, how to make efficiency savings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, really difficult decisions have to be made. But often, what we found when we started doing these impact assessments is that the, uh, these decisions are being made siloed in individual departments within public authorities, and they're not people are not always aware of the impacts, the cumulative impacts of, of these kind of spending cuts on people's lives. So we did a first report, um, Unraveling Equality, a Human Rights and Equality Impact Assessment of the Spending Cuts on Women in Coventry. Imp it assessed uh, women generally in Coventry and it found a whole range of different impacts, but probably the most profound were looking at issues like um, uh, how it affected women who'd been victims of domestic violence and rape. And there we found that there were cuts to, for instance, the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, specialists who are working on domestic violence issues, to the police who are working on these kind of issues, to healthcare budgets to deal with mental health issues that were impacting on, on women who were suffering post-traumatic stress disorder. Also, the budgets that were given to uh, civil society groups who had previously worked with those women to support their cases to, to help them with treatment afterwards. And all this was having a cumulative effect that no one individually in, in, in individual authorities was aware of because they weren't looking at the impact on the women's lives themselves. The individuals for whom the human rights approach is absolutely crucial. Um, we then did a, a second report, health, uh, health so looking at um, the impact of the spending cuts on older women. We're now on to a third one, looking at the impact on uh, black and minority ethnic women um, as well. Um, and this is the, actually the, the you'll be, not the whole report you'll be pleased to hear, but the executive summary is in your packs, um, uh, just so you can have a look at that. But there we found, for instance, on older women, there were a, a, a range of impacts, but one of the most interesting, perhaps, for this audience is thinking about the combined impact uh, for, uh, on serious health risks to women. And on page two of the, you can have a look at this afterwards, on page two of the, the report of the executive summary, it just summarises there. Um, the issue of cuts to welfare benefits, uh, cuts to health and social care services, cuts to public transport, cuts to advice and support services, all cumulatively having, cumulatively having this effect, which pose serious health risks to older women in Coventry. And, um, if, if people are interested, they can look at the more detailed report on our website as well. Um, but I'm just going to read out one little set of quotes from, from the report itself, which was actually, for me, the most disturbing and upsetting uh, part of undertaking uh, the human rights impact assessment, which was that we identified from talking to a range of different groups, from healthcare professionals themselves in Coventry, and then from groups who are providing services to women there, that there was a particular issue with um, older women leaving, uh, leaving hospitals, and that transition between being looked after by healthcare professionals and social care and the gaps that were being left as a result of cuts to services. And so we, went, we got focus groups together and we went to speak to these women and we heard their stories. And here are a couple of quotes from the report. I had a personal horrible experience. Just before Christmas I had surgery. As soon as it was finished they said, you can go home. There was no aftercare. I've lost my husband. I could not even move from one room to another. I could, do not, could not do anything but I had to go home. I have to sit for three hours on a chair in outpatients and then they said I could go home, but there was no one to look after me. Another woman saying, I had no one to look after me. I had a heart attack. My husband died of a heart attack. I was feeling so stressed and worried about because there was no one. I was worried I was going to have another attack. I was discharged from hospital. No one was at home. I was going through bereavement, loneliness, the loss of him. It was horrible. I didn't get any help. It was awful to go through this. And it really is, I think the benefits of adopting a kind of human rights approach to these kind of issues that draws out these kind of stories of individuals that makes the human being the center of the kind of assessment process and, and then pr by the medium of telling these kind of stories uh, impresses on people the importance of uh, the services that have been lost. And so we were able to bring this report to uh, both social care services and the NHS in, in Coventry and talk to the um, uh, civil society organisations who are also involved in, in those kind of transitions and start a conversation about how that could be done better. 
Okay, so um, that's for me the benefits of adopting a kind of human rights approach to these problems. It sets minimum standards for what we should expect, and that needs applying carefully in the context of, of healthcare. But when it's done, I think it's very valuable. And it gives us a framework within which to explore what the effects of complex policies are on individuals, on the individuals that at the end of the day are um, the centre of the services we provide. So what are the pitfalls of a human rights approach and how do we overcome them? Well, in, in my work, what I've, I, what I've found in the past is that people find that human rights are abstract and they're scary, they're high-level things. Talk about torture and inhuman and degrading treatment and privacy. They're abstract concepts that need applying in everyday life. And that is a, a complex and difficult process. It's not easy. Um, and no one in the room should feel uh, uh, undermined or, 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 or worried that they can't do that as a natural process. It takes, it, it, it takes thinking about. Second thing, and connected to that, I therefore need a leading human rights expert, QC or someone, on my shoulder all the time to tell me how, to, how, these, how these processes work. And thirdly, um, isn't this going to take me a huge amount of effort and resources just when those are in very short supply, particularly at the moment? So those are the kind of pitfalls I've seen when I've been addressing these kind of issues before. So taking them one by one. Yes, human rights are abstract and scary. And they cannot be left to be applied by each healthcare professional and you. So I've sort of seen one healthcare trust in, in England where all they did to help uh, health professionals to do their own impact assessment process was had an appendix of the European Convention on Human Rights at the back of a document so that your nurse or doctor doing the assessment could read there is a prohibition of torture or a right to privacy and actually that doesn't help at all does it when you're thinking about how those, how those rights are applied. There is a need to think about the kind of guidance and support that individual assessors need very carefully in order to produce these assessments but when they do have that guidance and support profound things can happen. So, I mean, in a very small way, with our reports that we've done, we then produced guidance and training for other groups around the country to do the similar kinds of assessments, and admittedly this is civil society groups, but I think the same principles apply. And as a result, we now have assessments being undertaken in Bristol, in Islington, in North Yorkshire, adopting the same model. It's not something that happens immediately, but with time and effort and engagement, these principles can be got across. Um, you do need to involve human rights expertise at a certain point. Um, but as I said, I think there are, we, can, we can develop our intuitions, our own individual intuitions about how and when human rights are applied. So it's a kind of marriage of human rights and health expertise. You certainly wouldn't want to let me loose, for instance, on your healthcare system without a huge amount of uh, interaction with, with, with people with a lot of health healthcare um, expertise. Human rights by itself needs to be applied uh, in, in situations where, uh, where, where, where that healthcare expertise is present. Um, and through thinking about human rights uh, approaches and methodologies at events like this, I think we develop stronger and stronger intuitions about how they can be applied in practice. And then, at a later stage, we can come and talk to a, a, a human rights expert when we think, when we've already got an idea and a thought, that there may be human rights issues here. So when resources are most scarce, finally, um, I think human rights analysis becomes the most important. So when you have lack of resources, when you're making really, really tough decisions, um, it should tell you what you really, really can't do without. Um, but it also strengthens the case for working together. And that's why I think events like this are really important. Because what you need to do, and what my experience is, is you need to think together about how to develop methodologies for do this. You need to share your resources. There's a huge <coughs> evidence base out there about uh, health outcomes that you all need to draw upon. There is a, a, a sharing of findings of your work as well that can strengthen other people's practice. Um, so I really believe that human rights can provide massive added value, but I think it's through events like this today where we share and explore how we apply those human rights in individual cases and circumstances that we can really make it have a profound effect. Thank you. <laughs>